Hello, artists and animators, and welcome to another Toon Boom interview. Lack of Daisy is a long running webcomic written and drawn by Tracy Butler. This Eisner nominated series follows the rise and fall of the Lack of Daisy Speakeasy as Mitzi May seeks help from unconventional places to keep the dying speakeasy open. Also, the plot takes place entirely in an alternative version of Prohibition era St. Louis, inhabited entirely by cats. After 14 years of publishing her comic online, Tracy Butler teamed up with Fable Siegel to develop an animated adaptation of Lackadaisy. Fable's industry credits include work with the likes of Titmouse, Starburns, and Hasbin Hotel. They are joined today by Ludo, a storyboard artist at DreamWorks, who is also working on their short film. Tracy Fable and Lugo, Ludo, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the stream. Ah. Hello, thank you for having us on board. Yeah, for thanks, for, thanks for inviting us. What up? <laughs> hey. So uh, when I last spoke with Fable directly, uh, you were all in the middle of crowdfunding this project. What was that experience like? Hell. Intense. <laughs> um, yeah, we uh, we went into it. Uh, I had not done any kind of Kickstarter or anything for Lackadaisy before, not even for book publication, and uh, so I was I was new to that. Although I had been um, doing my own sort of crowdfunding through Patreon on a smaller basis for a time beforehand, and I don't think Fable had done a Kickstarter before, or uh, for not for something. I've done like one scale, and it but, failed terribly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, so we uh, we brought um, uh, we we ended up teaming up with um, uh, Spike Trotman uh, of Iron Circus uh, to kind of help us along with that. And uh, Spike is now our executive producer on this. Uh, they brought their expertise with Kickstarter with them and um, helped us put together a pretty killer campaign, I think. And uh, it kind of blew past our our expectations. So that was great. But it was also like a really, that whole month was, um, was just a blur of, of constant activity, constantly trying to keep, uh, keep people's interest and eyes on the, on the campaign. And, and a pandemic was yeah. starting. <laughs> yeah. And the pandemic had set in and yeah, we, we felt a little sheepish. Uh, a lot of people were going, uh, being laid off and going on furlough and, and everybody was worried about, of course, the, the virus and everything. And um, so we, we we didn't plan it that way, of course. But the, the <laughs> Kickstarter launched like right after the right after a lot of the states went into lockdown and, um, and the economy tanked. And <laughs> so we were like, oh no, <laughs> this doesn't seem this doesn't bode well. But it it actually turned out really well. And and possibly I think it, it may have had something to do with people just needing needing some distraction, something fun to to look at and enjoy, and not think about reality for a bit. So. Yeah. We debated whether or not we would delay the Kickstarter even, and I was like, no, we should not, because I feel like it's only going to get worse, so if we keep yeah, I think then that's going to be our, our best window of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, definitely. it was like going 60 miles per hour, potentially into a brick wall. So right. we just had to trust that the wall would not be there. We were either going to blast through that wall or we were going to stop dead and all have a major concussion for a little while. But um, we were going to live yeah. as Rocky for a little bit if yeah. Uh, yeah. that had happened. Yeah. But that didn't happen. <laughs> Fable, you're saying earlier that uh, for, for you, the, the, this crowdfunding campaign was particularly intense because you were doing 24 hour live streams. What was that like? So, uh, yeah, I was doing quite a few streams to help promote everything um, mm -hmm. where we'd have like character specific days. Uh, where it was like, hey, make your request, hey, donate to the Kickstarter, check, check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out. Because you have to like scream as loud as possible when the entirety of social media is talking about one thing and one thing only. Uh, yeah. it, it really it takes a heavy lift to cut through all that and get people to, to listen to what you're doing. Um, and uh, somehow we did cut through all that mess. But the 24 hour stream was the, the last 24 hours of the Kickstarter. And that was planned only a few days in advance where suddenly it was like, I woke up, realized, oh shit, we don't have anything planned for uh, the last, uh, for the very last day, what can we do? And uh, I was like, let's do a 24 hour stream. We can have uh, vintage movies that are, you know, copyright free because they're so old playing so Metropolis and, uh, Nosferatu, and we'll have guests on that to chat because we have some supporters of the project who uh, were really eager to come on and talk, and, and they brought some of their fans with them. And uh, just, 
uh, doing artwork and uh, our community manager who's also our 3d modeler uh, got the um the fan community to build a minecraft server that where they uh they they recreated saint louis in the comic and they recreated the speakeasy in minecraft um with tons of joke buildings and we just popped in occasionally and uh just um yeah those have checked on the progress of that uh, the movies were very helpful because every time you put on the movie, it was like, all right, dad's tired. I'm going to go take a sleep. <laughs> you kids. Yeah. Enjoy it was, it was a, a pretty intense time of just trying to mm. cover all the bases on like every, so many, so many social media platforms now and, and trying to get the word out and keep, keep people interested um, across like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and, and Instagram and all of those. It was just like a runner. We were like running around every single day, like posting something here, posting something there, sharing this article and that article. It really helped that we got some really amazing press out of it too. I think like Forbes ran an article. Uh, Not that article. Oh God, Yeah. And um, several other, <laughs> several other outlets too. Yeah. It was such a blur, yeah. though. I, I can't even remember uh, <laughs> where else we Every were. Every week there was like one or two things would come out, and, and that was in the trying to boost both thing that popped up and then hoping that it would boost us and uh, just just crossing our fingers and really, 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 really hoping that things went well. Because I, I was pretty sure that we would hit our first goal, but that wasn't the real goal. The real goal was to get, um, you know, beyond 150 because past that point, I felt like, okay, we could do most of everything that we wanted to do. The fact that it went over 300,000, that we, we landed on 330,000 was like, holy crap, I was surprised. Um, <laughs> and so we've been able to uh, organize the short and like, uh, and bring people on board and like pay them well and, and make sure that everything, uh, you know, functions like the way that I've, I've always really wanted to run a production more or less um thanks to everybody's generosity and so i'm like so super super grateful for all the the everything everybody's given to this project like it it really feels like we have um like uh the wind at our backs you know even with as dire as everything has been it's like uh folks kind of created this collective lifeboat for some cartoonists to go um entertain them with some some kitty cats some some booze running kitty cats speaking of i wanted to ask tracy uh, what made you want to self-publish webcomic and what was it like when you first started publishing the series in 2006 um so i didn't go into it thinking about publication at all i just i just wanted to do this this art project and, and kind of like find a way to share my ideas um I was working in the game industry when I began and I'd kind of moved up from being a, I'd been there for a while and kind of moved up from being a, just like a, a worker bee sort of artist to being um, a, an art director where I was really doing a lot of managerial work and, you know, hiring and, and training people and um, reviewing portfolios and delegating tasks and that sort of thing. And I was, I was going a bit nuts, not having my hands on the artwork on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I kind of, needed an outlet in the evening hours to for my own creativity for my own purposes and so that's when I started the comic um and uh and that that kind of led to it taking over my entire life I, I thought of, I thought it would be like a side project um at the time I, and I thought I could just kind of do it casually but it turned out that it, it, I mean, it just took over my, my, my brain and my life and, <laughs> and I it ended up being my career. So, um, and my, you know, my great love, my great art, you know, it's, it's probably the, my one big passion project, uh, in life. So, um, so yeah, I really, uh, really enjoyed it and, and really have just, uh, my approach was really to just build a, a simple little website and, um, and, and start sharing comics. And uh, I shared some of the development process and everything back in the day on DeviantArt and mm -hmm. people seemed interested in it. I probably picked up a lot of my early readership from there. And, um, and, and so that was all very encouraging. And that just, just kind of snowballed into, into something bigger, right? I had, um, had a, a dear friend come and help me build a better website for it. And uh, we had a forum community and that kind of expanded into a um, discord community that's very active and, uh, and, so yeah, uh, and then I, I left my job um, a few years ago to, to focus on the comic full time. And 
Yeah, so uh, it, I really wasn't thinking about um, like publication, but it just is something that became a possibility as I went. And so I did it. Um, and that wow. I myself here. Yeah. Uh, Fable and Ludo, when did you first learn about Lackadaisy? Well, I, I, I first learned about it probably around the same time as Tracy started putting up the, uh, the early panels, the early pages, which were just like exploration pieces, really. It wasn't the, uh, the official comic pages that made it into the book. But I, I remember the first comic that I saw was Rocky and Freckle burying a body while Rocky, like, uh, enunciated some poetry. And then they're interrupted by Nina in the end. Um, and that made me laugh. So, of course, I was like, well, I got to follow this. Because the, the, this is delightful. <laughs> it's like you don't usually see writing that's like quite that whimsical and um, d uh, dares to use big words. So, uh, yeah, but I've been following it for a, a while and it's it, it's inspired me in my own work as well, where I've seen how Tracy has developed that comic. And it's encouraged me to try the same with my own comics, like doing mini comics to explore characters and eventually like biting the bullet and starting your own thing. It's great shit. <laughs> yeah, and I know for me, um, I actually got the published version back in, I would say, probably like 2011, 2012 at the latest, and uh, read it while waiting for jury duty. So I had just burned through the whole first volume and kind of instantly became attached to the story in the world that was being built. That should be a quote on the uh, the dust jacket. Read it during jury duty. Great for jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, I wanted to ask what attracted you to the uh, the Prohibition era setting and what does that let you explore? Uh, so I, I guess I, I became a little bit enraptured with the history of, uh, of my neighborhood because I bought an old house out here near St. Louis and uh, started researching the history of the city and discovered that there were these caves under the city and that they had a long history of being used by, well, first by um, by legitimate breweries. This is a was a big um, beer town, basically. Um, and and then later, uh, when prohibition set in, um, the the whole alcohol industry basically like literally moved underground. And that really fascinated me. And so um, I thought that was kind of rife for um, uh, for storytelling. And then uh, in addition to that, the 20s is such a unusual and and bizarre so almost almost the start of the modern age in a way um kind of launching off it was so different from the victorian and Ed edwardian a eras before it um things just really right after world war one just kind of like exploded into this strange pop culture ad um oh, like overflowing with ads and and art and new music and things and it's just like a very um kind of scintillating yeah, topic of, of to yeah, you can really see like, the explore. kernels of modern American culture like show up in the next Yeah, you can really see yeah where where so much of our uh, focus on youth culture and things like that really began, um, and and even so much of like what what our idea of like uh, progressive politics are and things like that um, really started there uh, pretty much in speakeasies, <laughs> yeah. um, women being able to be out and about and, and drink in public, whereas that was so taboo before, um, people of different races being able to mingle together uh, and things of that nature, um, lots of... Um, a lot uh, of queer culture showing queer culture actually, yeah it was was speaking. it was still very above ground it was still like in day-to-day -day life it was still not considered part of a uh, you know polite society but below ground people had a place to be and to exist openly and perform and, and things like that and so um it's all just a very very interesting time and, and kind of um kind of uh um enticing thing to to approach at, from an artistic standpoint so uh yeah, it just had all those elements that, that really, really made me want, want to explore it further and, and draw pictures of it and, and read about it. And uh, I kind of, yeah, I have, have fallen in love with it. So, Yeah, Fable, what does this let you explore as an animator and uh, animation director? Oh, well, I, I'm just kind of that nerd. So <laughs> uh, I have a similar taste as Tracy when it comes to like just falling down research rabbit holes and getting really really interested in the the origins of certain things like the aesthetic of the 20s is just amazingly appealing also cats that's fun. <laughs> um uh but as a as a filmmaker and a storyteller it, it's been really fun to collaborate with tracy and to like bounce off of her and like really kind of get into her head and like adopt the characters into my own head to best understand them so that 
when I'm giving direction to the rest of the crew, it can be um, true to like who those characters are as much as possible. So, um, and uh, largely I, I think because me and Tracy have very similar opinions about um, artistic approach, like that works out. Um, but then I can take my expertise and kind of like filter that in a way that makes sense for animation production. So like the characters aren't like crazy rendered out like with uh, uh, intense lighting schemes, but um, figuring out how to boil that down to something that can be reproducible by a big team of people is, uh, has been a really fun challenge. Um, as well as like getting everybody like excited about working with these characters, which is, um, you know, like the, usually on a project when you're jumping on, like you don't get all this material to to look at. Like you don't get to like know the character very well when you're being asked to board them or animate them um, when you're on a cartoon because they're usually fairly simple they can be boiled down to a few different facets you know they don't have a whole lot of material unless it's a project that's been going on for like years and years and years and most animated productions don't go beyond like two to three seasons if they get that even oh yeah there's they're always still figuring it out like in the early yeah. stages when you're on like the first season they don't even a lot of the times know who the characters fully are uh, yeah moving forward yeah but in, in this case, with this project, you have the pitch pipe already. You can just sit down and like read the comic. And so all the animators and the voice actors and the board artists could uh, look at the source material and get inspired by that and pull that into what they were doing, along with the direction where I told them to um, you know, look to, in the case of the board artists, like I, I asked them to look into the work of like Fritz Lang, for instance, and uh, films from the 20s and the 30s and how they staged things and how they treated their camera work um, with the intense interest in uh, um, staging and lighting and how the composition of the frame, the camera is just locked down, like how that tells the story versus a lot of modern storytelling where we usually um, in film and TV, we cut back and forth a lot. There's a lot of like mid shot, far shot, mid shot, mid shot, close shot. Um, asking folks to keep the camera kind of in realistic proportion where it's like, imagine that you are standing there in the scene and you are holding the camera, where would you put the camera? And we gave them 3D backgrounds so that it was easier to think along those lines because then it wasn't like, oh, you have to draw the background. You're actually putting the camera in a space that um, will then be rendered later on. Um, but despite like all the freedom that you could have with that environment in an animated environment, you could put the camera anywhere. You could put it on the ceiling. You can make a zoom around like a mosquito, but does that tell a good story? And that's one reason why I asked uh, the folks on board to look at that, uh, those old films for inspiration uh, in terms of staging, because it's just the, the limitations of the time meant that they had to think very carefully about how they chose the shot and, and yeah. planning ahead quite a bit. So, Ludo, as a, a storyboard artist working on this project, how did you feel about those constraints? Um, personally, I enjoyed working with them because it made you really think a bit more about what you wanted to express and tell in each shot, um, as well as how to combine shots, which is super, super important. And also, one thing I really liked about this production is you could actually go very wide um, on most productions, they want you to kind of keep the camera in a little bit more so, um, usually due to crowds and things like that. But on this, I loved how each time I was being told to just like go wider, go wider, especially when showing off these uh, wonderful 3D landscapes that were built. With the characters being so expressive in this series, it's really fun just to let them play out in each shot. And especially the animation so far is so fluid and incredible. Um, I'm excited for people to see it. Yeah, I, I hate to interrupt, but uh, our mutual friend, uh, Marie-Ève Lassell, uh, commented in the chat, hey, Tracy, is there something you learned or that changed about your art and craft since you uh, took on this project? I have learned so much in such a short amount of time. It's almost overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, I, I went in thinking I had a pretty good idea of what uh, development on an animated film would, would be like in a virtual studio setting and that we've, that we've got working here. Um, but I didn't know half of it. Um, not even less than half. It was, uh, it, it's been like just, just the whole process of how, how each thing goes step by step, how all the gears are kind of turning at once. Um, and everything has just been enlightening, but it's also been, um, 
it's also like opened my eyes about some of the design choices that when I designed these characters, I was I, I treated them basically as illustrations, and and so I I kind of went nuts with the detail and the the value rendering and things, and um, kind of working with uh, um, some of our. Uh, character designers on um, developing something that's more animatable. I've really developed more of an appreciation for simplified designs because there's such a it's such a art form in itself to kind of um, uh, whittle something down to its its more basic elements, but also but make it look good. It it, it, it may um, to an outsider look or to uh, a layperson who isn't an artist may look like uh, cartoonier art is easier, but it's really not. The case it's kind of its own skill set to be able to take something and and simplify it and make it still look really good so that you can draw it repeatedly in you know uh 24 frames a second yeah um so that's been great and i mean just watching um watching how the uh background artists work and and use 3d models to um to kind of build backgrounds from and and everything all that planning and and kind of just like learning learning more about blender um and and toon boom itself has been just really cool i mean these are i've worked with 3d software for a long time in the game industry but hadn't worked with blender so much and so um the grease pencil tool and everything has been just like wow this is so cool <laughs> look at all the things you could potentially do with this um so yeah it's it's kind of got me um just really really jazzed about animation in general like i was already an animation fan but um but this has been yeah just uh, i've learned so many things i i don't even know what i'm going to do with it all after after we've finished the short film I, I hope i'll be able to put it to more use going ahead yeah, well, that segues really well with my next question which is what are some of the challenges that came with adapting uh, a work that was from comics to animation because those crafts are similar in a lot of ways but also very different yeah there's definitely some overlap but but like i said yeah we we had to kind of undertake the challenge of, of re rebuilding the characters for animation without lo without losing anything um, of them, and so that's been um, tricky but but fun. And uh, and I'll let Fable talk about some of the other stuff because I know they had a lot to say about that. So yeah, well, um, I mean, one of the major differences between comics and and doing animation is that in animation you're restricted to that rectangular frame. You don't have like a a canvas where you can just like scroll up and down or like a page where you can fit the composition and piece it together however you like and know that um, whoever's reading it is going to read it at their own pace and that their eye will follow the uh, the composition in a certain way. In um, animation, you have to guide people's eye a lot more. You're cutting between things like it, the the frame will just change before your eyes. So you have to keep that in mind because that will radically change how you um, approach composition, the flow of a scene, like the uh, the fact that there's an audio element there, not just a visual one, will also add a lot. So like you can have um, audio cues happening that you couldn't have in a comic, even with like all the text bubbles that you could put up. But there's there's no way you could capture all the ambient sound, the the ambient sound like of an environment along with like the, the clink of a shovel and then, you know, the particular vocal performance, how it's given, like you can add a specificity to um, what you're seeing that you don't see in a comic. And in a comic, like that sense of interpretation is part of the enjoyment of a medium, like it's, it's unique to it. But in animation, like there's all these layers like to the creation of this like very advanced puppet show effectively that add a lot to, um, to the experience and, uh, can lead you to like surmise certain things about like what the characters are feeling or thinking or how they're motivated in a way that you might not necessarily get if you were just interpreting everything in your head instead. So um, the uh, it, it it definitely there's there's definitely a different approach there, um, and the limitations also can add a lot to that as well since. Uh, you know, there's a lot of freedom to mush stuff around when you're on comics like. Uh, uh, when I've done comics, and Tracy frequently ha has talked about this also, where uh, before you upload the comic, you're still messing with it. Like, you can tweak the dialogue, you can tweak the lighting, you can adjust the colors. But in animation, you need to plan things out very precisely. Otherwise, you're going to have problems later down the line. So much of animation really depends on the pre-production process, setting up the blueprint, having a solid script, you know, knowing where you're going to go before you even get there 
and um, imagining the future like months in advance. Um, that's not something you really have to do for comics. Like you might plan the story ahead to a certain degree, but it's much more morphable. Um, but we can't we can't afford to like reanimate shots or bring in the voice actors like 50 different times because we had like a new idea for a piece of dialogue. You have to commit to things. So you have to have a certain amount of confidence and in, in, in your planning process and also go, you know, buy the next thing, like we'll get even better potentially. Uh, well, hopefully there's a next thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it presents a, a, a huge challenge that is uh, largely about how do you structure your production? How do you, how do That's you- That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask Ludo, since uh, Ludo's on uh, your, your storyboarding team, uh, how, how he approached the challenge of um, approaching uh, something in comics to storyboarding and then storyboarding to animation. For me, like my brain just completely works in cinematic language. It's actually very hard for me uh, to take it the opposite way to that basically free canvas, because a lot of the times, especially in animation, like when you're adapting something, you really have to cut it down to what's really important due to the budget. Um, so a lot of the times, like in comics, it'd be cool because you can do a huge, large, a huge, large crowd scene show hundreds of people walking through it's basically whatever you can draw but when you convert that to animation or anything like that you have to really put the camera down low and hide people um basically put like characters in the foreground and you have to basically what we were taught especially when i was at dreamworks is you have to make it feel like you're watching a crowd but with a maximum of eight people <laughs> <laughs> so it's Keep like i remember low. yeah so it's like on kung fu panda we had to do a huge scene in front of the emperor with basically the whole city, but yet they're like place the cameras down low. It has to feel like the whole city. Um, so a lot of it is with sound and just really, um, I guess, creative camera angles to hide things. It's, it's a clever cheat. It's a really creative magic trick, really. The, the frugality yeah. is an art form in, its, in itself. Um, mm -hmm. Just something that's very relatively new to me because in the past I've, I've just had the freedom to draw whatever I want. Granted, it takes a long time to draw a crowd scene, but if you're only drawing one panel, one big spread or something of, of that, and then zooming the camera in on characters later on, it's it's a different different story from having to anim from having to recreate that in a cinematic sense and then having to have that crowd move and appear like realistically yeah. alive yeah because when i watch like the studio like studio ghibli oh my god the way they animate their cities the crowds yeah. every character is oh, doing so. something different and that to me is so incredibly amazing and i don't even <laughs> i can't even comprehend that <laughs> yeah uh, i know your team brought um uh, a storyboard sample from the project for us to look at um would you be able to cue that up for our audience sure uh i can bring up ooh, uh, a little bit of a uh, could show off the Act One animatic. Okay, so um, here I have the animatic for uh, for Act One uh, that I handed out. So I'll just mute this because nobody needs to hear uh, Rocky screaming. <laughs> but uh, you can see like how we uh, approached it. And these these particular boards are are done by me. Uh, Ludo actually did Act Three, but I'm not allowed to show that right now. So um, if anybody has followed us as the Kickstarter, and some of these boards will be pretty familiar. Um, cause, uh, so lots of this was actually in our Kickstarter, but then, um, quite a bit more has been done as well, naturally. Uh, shout so. out to, to our 3D artist, Newt, too, for building all of those backgrounds for us to, uh, to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looks like so you've hosted out. streams with the, uh, the, the project's voice actors. Uh, Tracy, what was it like for you to hear these characters' voiced after living with them for oh, uh, was... fourteen plus years? <laughs> Trippy. Um, <laughs> we we were pretty um, pretty picky about our our casting choices. We spent a lot of time. Some people, um, I mean, just nailed it right off the bat, and then others we had to really you know, like search around for the right voice. Um, and it, it because it was um, because I had such a solid idea of what they would sound like in my head. And so we, we really tried to match that as best best we could. And uh, we found some really amazing talents and, and even people who like we had so many people um, set, send their reels in who were just amazing, but just didn't quite like fit the character voice. So I almost feel bad that we didn't hire them because they're so good, but it's just like, couldn't match you it up. Put so them much. in your pocket for later, basically. Yeah, you say, you you say like, those names well. for later and you, you recommend them to other projects or whatever. But um, 
or, or, you know, if you have something come up that, that you can use them for, you, you know, reach out. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's been like just this, it's added a whole new dimension to the characters for me because, um, like it's, it's like acting and voice acting is, is its own like performance art and, and to have like that in addition to the visual art that I'm so used to working with, um, like layered on top of it, like it is literally just more dimension to, to everything. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, I think uh, probably if there's a downside to it, it's that everybody, when you, when you read a comic or a book, you kind of, the, the character voices are in your head and you kind of come up with your own version of what it sounds like. And in that way, it makes the story a little bit your own because, you know, mm-hmm. all of the, the way the characters sound and, and the amb- ambient music and noise and things is, is all left up to you. Um, so you become a creator in a, in a sense, you know, it becomes part of a creative project you're involved in, in a way. But um, when you have to, you have to like nail it down and pick something very specific for something like this. Um, you're obviously, you're going to run into a situation where it doesn't match up with what everybody imagined. It matches up with what I imagined, but, <laughs> but that may not match up with what someone else does. And so that there's a little bit of like pushback sometimes from, from old time, like long time readers who are like, Oh, I didn't think the character sounded like this, but I think like the more some we, people, some people were convinced that Rocky would have like a deep Southern accent. Yeah. I don't know why. He with such actual, a like, he's, such a stringy, family goes, what? he's such a street scrappy character. I don't know where they got that he would have a deep voice, but that's interesting to me. Like I, yeah. I just am curious, always curious about like what, what people do take away from the characters. And so it's kind of, uh, um, illuminating to me in that way, like what what people actually thought they did sound like uh, to some extent. But I think like a lot of people have warmed up to even if the voice didn't match what they initially thought. Like the the actors are are just so good, and um, I've been so happy with their performances. And, and we're going to be releasing some um, comic dubs and things soon, leading up to oh, yeah, yeah. We like, we've, we've we made more use of these actors outside of the yeah. Uh, yeah, we've I, had such fun outside of the short because it was like uh, it, it's a shame if they can only work on the short. Uh, so we're really happy to get their get their uh, work on the on the comic dubs, which was also really useful as like letting those actors like warm up into the voices a little bit before they even did their performances for the short. So uh, that made me pancakes. Yes, yeah, we're excited to put that together. But yeah, it's it's been fun like um, seeing the uh, how many people are like suddenly becoming fans of like those performances, like. Uh, as I've been doing editing and I've been um, I've been streaming sometimes my editing process and I'll be picking through different uh, different line reads uh, by Bell Rusape, who is uh, the, the guy playing Freckle. And suddenly people are getting like they're like, man, I'm a fan of this guy now because like hearing all the different variations of laughs, like just crazy, crazy mad laughter that Bell is able to do. It's like now he has some fans and I'm just so happy because I, I really want like everybody on crew to be known. Like anytime they have like some other thing that they have going on where it's like, hey, I got hired on this and I'm like, sweet success. Uh, you know, I really want them to do well uh, even past this project because it makes me proud. Like, oh you yeah. I that, that um, awesome. Because th- th- this project came about from a Kickstarter that you're able to be more transparent about the animation process than on previous projects you've worked on? Yeah, you know, there, we don't have to answer to anybody but ourselves, really. Like, all the, uh, the limitations on, in terms of, like, what we want to share is based on what we personally want to reveal bit by bit. So, like, uh, I can't share anything on Act 3, and I'll talk about it in terms of euphemisms, but... Um, but that's because I want some mystery for people. But at the same time, I really want folks to kind of get some insight into the animation production process because I feel like animation as a medium needs to be more egalitarian for the future to, to really grow and expand and become like a, a place of diverse storytelling. Like the more you can open up those tools and make them more available to people, the more people know how to even construct a cartoon, then the more interesting stories you'll see. And I don't think that we we should rely on major studios to provide that kind of uh, storytelling for us because they're always going to be limited by their shareholders and what they ask for and the the teams of people that they've been working with. And um, uh, you can get more interesting stories if you just reach out to a broader group of people and say, hey, you do something. And we're in a time period now where getting eyeballs on a thing is easier than ever. I mean, you can upload stuff to YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo or or share things on Twitch. And 
um, get people engaged. You can get funding via Patreon, via Ko-fi, via, via Kickstarter, um, via GoFundMe. And it's, it's a lot more doable now than it ever used to be. And I really would love to also give people like some sort of insight onto how to make that happen. Maybe how to take not just a, make a cartoon and it's just something that you did with you and your friend, but how would you do it? And it's like a virtual studio with like a bigger crew where you can do something more ambitious. So um, my experience uh, in the virtual studio of uh, has been hotel informed how I developed this along with my experiences build, building um, communities uh, dedicated to um, just animation fans or like uh, communities around uh, various fan projects and that kind of thing. Just um, it, it teaches you a lot about what you could do in those spaces and what might be possible if you got everybody on board and everybody was like, okay, what if we did this, but also we got paid to do it. <laughs> um, there's just so much more you can do when you work together and you like imagine a little bit bigger and you get those resources and the, the resources and the, the place to communicate like that matters so, so much, so much. Yeah. Well, when we were talking earlier, you're mentioning that uh, the, the way you set up your virtual studio, uh, you have like multiple channels of communication and people aren't necessarily siloed. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about like how your team is set up and how you uh, made places available for them to, to hang out? Yeah, I mean, I really having experience being a freelance or work from home for different studios. I was often cut off from the rest of the crew. Uh, when you're not in the physical studio and you're you're not able to have that lunchroom water cooler talk, it's it's very lonely. You know what? I, the thing I like about this medium is the ability to work with other people, to to learn from other people. Um, there's just so much there. But when you're cut off from all that, it can feel very very frustrating. And I wanted to build a virtual space that felt very different from that. So even though you know we have team members from literally all over the world there is one space where they can all go in and hang out and they can share their like doodles and dumb memes and uh, cat pics. Uh, and so many people on this crew have adopted kittens since the start of the project. It's amazing. Um, one literally had a, a, a cat like give birth in, in her lap and I was just like, yeesh. Um, and it, it, it adds to uh, crew cohesion and seeing everybody else's work like as it's being made really increases the excitement and you want to do better and you you know the competitive nature of a lot of artists where they're like oh that's really awesome I want to do that too like starts to hook in um, and just the mutual respect between people but usually in studios I mean even if you are in studio uh, like you don't talk to the writers like you storyboard artists don't go and hang out with the animators if the animators are even in the same building frequently they're halfway across the world um the the voice actors just walk in they do their performance they walk out they don't get to talk to much of anybody you're lucky if you get to sit in and watch them actually perform but in our server everybody on crew stays there so the the voice actors have had the joy of like seeing their performances actually get built and they see the physical performance that goes along with their vocal performance and they get excited and their excitement uh, translates down to the animators and um, the animators like love to show off their work and uh, the the board artists get to see the animatic get built and like as it like evolves and grows and like what it what it really feels like once the the animated bits and the in the audio bits start to be pieced in um, getting to see sound design come together like that's a thing you never get to see so you learn so much about the process even when you are familiar with uh, how these things work and you've been in studio before um, you it's really fun to see it actually come together like to follow along with that to see your effort like be made like turned into something instead of just you watch it on tv a year later maybe you know so um it uh, what i'm hoping for is that like the folks on crew that they can come away from this and either we get lucky and something happens and we can keep working with them in the future or they get to make things together like they they uh go hey this person from this project uh was a really good voice actor and i'm starting something hey you want to come on board or wow i really need a character designer but who do i get in touch with oh i know i can get in touch with the, the person from this last project see if they want to pop on board or if they know anybody else who might be available and so you you could spawn like uh 10 different things potentially from that one project 
um, that would not have like happened otherwise. Like if you just had put everybody into their respective corners and told them don't talk to anybody else. Yeah, Ludo, uh, uh, what was your experience like on this project compared to uh, previous projects you've worked on? Um, well, kind of building off of what Fable was talking about is just like the collaboration, the openness that the crew has to share. Because, yeah, it's like when, um, especially if you're like working at an outsource studio, you cannot talk to like the main studio in LA. Like, just because there's barriers, executives don't want that line of communication even though it's again uh is the team down there the artists down there want to talk like they're like we want to collaborate more with people around the world but yet they're not allowed to buy the studio so it was really nice to have that freedom to converse with everyone because the only other studio that i actually kind of was able to do that a little bit uh was tip mouse up here in canada um, which kind of opened my eyes because we actually um when i was working on cleopatra in space we sat right next to the animators and you were able to instantly talk about issues they were having things we needed to basically work on on the boards um so it was nice in this production to be able to do that as well as uh learn off of one another yeah and uh tracy as as a creator uh what did it feel like to be able to talk to the team while they were working on this project um it is it was and ha and continues to be um, very exciting, very fulfilling to be able to interact with these other artists. It's like, like I was saying in the comments here, it's um, a bit nerve wracking and scary to cede control of your, you know, your brain children <laughs> and your, you know, your creative, because you take your art so personally, it's, it's hard to like hand over some part of that to other people. Um, and it's been a solo project for so long. It, it was it was scary, but um, now that I've gotten to know these artists and I've seen the work that they've done in the past and that they're that they're producing now, and I know that they're they're consummate creators themselves and they care about the project. Um, a lot of them are doing this not because they have to for a paycheck, but because they want to, and that that fills me with joy because that that means that they're here because they want to be here and they have an actual interest in doing in doing this. Um, and it's not just because you know they they have a you know gun to their head with in terms of their finances or something yeah and that, that's um, again what was cool coming on to this is like working directly with you it's like you don't get the chance to ever work with someone who is really passionate about the story who brought it to life originally yeah, so it's yeah. nice to actually be on something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah i feel like it's great that there's like a lot of that just just genuine interest there um and or and just like a love for obviously these people love animation and um so it all kinds of kind of like my my th whole thing has been like if, if it isn't coming from your heart it's going to show like people are going to be able to see that it's, it starts looking like rote and mechanical or or like you're pandering to an audience or something but if you're doing something and it's just like because you're so in love with it i think that thing the what the resulting um artwork will really shine and I and I feel like we're heading in that direction with this because I feel like people are are enjoying what they're doing, and um, I I sure hope I'm right about that. <laughs> I yeah. think so by and large, I, but I, um, I want them to be proud of the final product. Yeah. So like it, it makes me put my best into it because like the the thing I don't want to have happen is that it comes out and then someone's like, that was my shot, but eh, you know, and and it means that like I I try to like bring my best to it every day every day try to bring my okay. best and I, yeah so i i have i am very grateful like so many people have been working so hard on this um fable most of all uh and just putting in oh. like hour upon hour upon hour of work into it and i don't sleep yeah <laughs> nor do i but it's nice to have some company like late late at night <laughs> um, uh, by the way guys please actually get sleep take care of yourself yeah don't good, good don't do water. what we do uh, it's like not balance. an ideal mode believe me yeah do not do all nighters it kills no, you no, yeah i told the crew we actually have a custom emoji that they post for when i am up too late just to shame me to bed because <laughs> they're like fable go to bed fable go to bed <laughs> get some sleep damn it so I, it's... I, I like that. Uh, so I, one thing I noticed too when I was going through the uh, the, the, the comics uh, is that the, the early comics make uh, a lot of use out of sepia tones. Uh, in terms of visual style, what direction did you want to take this animated short in? And what were your inspirations? And uh, how did that have an influence? I mean, like vintage photos, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, like the the look and feel of uh, I I turned a lot actually to well, vintage photos are are pretty much a theme in in the comic, but uh, because the whole thing is is largely about nostalgia or or kind of living in the past a little bit. Um, but I also turned a lot toward um, ad art from the twenties. Uh, it was kind of like the um, the uh, golden age of, of illustration is <laughs> more or less the jazz age. Um, and so you have artists like Lion Decker and Norman Rockwell and um, uh, that other art you want to like lick. Right. Yeah. yeah. Art that's just so because printing had come a long way, like you could print in full color at this point. And so ad art just like exploded into this like it was like high art used to advertise products and it, it's gorgeous. And um, so I have these books that are just like even like clothing catalogs where they would they would um, instead of never seen photographing so good. Yeah, they would use <laughs> illustrations and paintings to of the clothing to sell it and um and all of it is just so beautiful and i mean you can just look at it as as um as true art even though it, it is sort of like that base like here's buy this thing <laughs> um and so I, I turned a lot to that as well like i i took that whole character gallery i did for the the comic for the website um uh and and made it kind of an ode to <laughs> 1920s ad art um they're, all of all of the images are kind of based off of uh actual ads from the 20s so um so yeah those visuals and then like things like um we talked a little bit about fritz lang and, and such and like old movies and, and like if you've seen metropolis i'm sure most people have at least heard of it um but uh fritz lang was a prolific director from that period and um, did some really like cinematography wise beautiful work um there was also it kind of like uh, where uh, German expressionism came from in the 30s and then and then further where like the look of old monster movies and stuff kind of emerged from that same thing. And um, so there's, there's just a lot to pull from in terms of like yeah. uh, visual inspiration. Art Deco is, is also so like tantalizingly like drool, like makes me drool. Some of the, the you art like Deco. geometry because Art yeah. Deco, dear Lord. Oh yeah. It's I cool. love me some geometry. Right? Yeah. It was like the twenties kind of had a bit of an overlap of, um, Art Nouveau kind of bleeding in from the Edwardian era still. And then the Art Deco was just starting to become really popular and that lasted through the, through the forties. So you kind of get that nice blend where it's got, it's, it's Art Deco, but it's got kind of a very naturalistic feel to it that, and I really like to play with those, those sorts of motifs and things and, and uh, yeah, so that's. I probably yeah, um, a bit of the art uh, that we have for the production um, on my screen. So, yeah, it's like here we have like the lackadaisy itself, like in three D. Like this was built inside a blender, and to to give this set to the board arts and just say, yeah, just pop the camera in there. Like where where's good? <laughs> um, means that they can they have a lot more freedom for like. Uh, choosing a shot where they don't have to like spend a ton of time like drawing the background and worrying about that it's like it's fine just pick a good shot give me a good angle it's there you can import that into storyboard pro yeah exactly like uh, i frequently am moving between blender and, and storyboard pro um to uh to see like if the if everything like works out like i can import in um pngs uh, from uh from Blender that I export like out of the viewport and into Storyboard Pro, it does make it pretty easy, like the the file sorting system to just like update your folder and there you go, is all your materials as you are. Yeah. And then um, we, we have about uh, ten minutes left in the conversation, so I want to ask you before we go real quickly uh, of um, how have expectations about an adult animation changed in the past decade and where you'd like to see it go. I mean, um, definitely there's a door has opened that didn't used to exist. Uh, adult animation is now like a possibility. Like I remember growing up, there really, outside of like The Simpsons, there really wasn't cartoons for adults so much. MTV had a period where they did something interesting, I think called Liquid Television, where they did uh, cartoons that were meant for the older age group, but it was still mostly teenagers they were aiming at. Um, and, uh, you know, adult animation, still is largely about like comedy sitcom you know, comic sitcoms like very light episodic storytelling generally but lately with the advent of streaming platforms where the idea is that you sit down and you you binge a show like you watch it from beginning to end it's not going to be you know the episodes aren't going to be like shuffled around out of order 
um, you have the option for longer form storytelling, which means that you can get like deeper, more complex storytelling. So it used to be that more complex storytelling would be the realm of, uh, say, you know, film because they had more time. But nowadays it feels more like film is the short form storytelling and long form storytelling is what you can do in television. And so the same is true in animation. Um, but it's there's still like a limited number of uh, animated projects that are really aimed at adults. I think BoJack Horseman might be one of the more successful ones recently that takes on adult com topics and and really deeply explores like an existential crisis, depression, addiction, all that stuff, um, which you don't get normally in say Family Guy <laughs> with uh, yeah. that much depth. Um, well, where it sort of looks like it's a sitcom, but it's really a drama. It is, it is. So it has all the trappings of like your usual like uh, puppeted, rigged uh, cartoon that's going to be kind of Family Guy like, which is going to be like jokes, 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 and then maybe there's a serious moment, but then we wrap it up by the end and we move on to the next thing. But um, Bojack Horseman has a very long form story that is told over the course of like what five seasons was it? Mm -hmm. um, that where to get like the full experience of that story you actually have to follow it from beginning to end like it was the, the structure of it is is quite tight um and i just would love to see more of that kind of thing but um not even from like starting off a sitcom like lackadaisy if we were so lucky to get it made into a tv series wouldn't be a sitcom it's it's just not that bright and sunny and it, it's very much has a direction with its story and while it's extremely character driven it's it's not it's not a sitcom even if it does have a lot of comedy in it i mean these characters can be pretty goofy but they're usually not like cracking jokes specifically a lot of the comedy comes from like the physicality of those characters or like how they read a line and the reactions to things and just the sheer absurdity of a movement of a moment um, so it's a, it's a very different kind of, uh, of tone than you're used to seeing in a cartoon. And I really hope that we can continue to explore that. Or at the very minimum, I hope that, you know, the short comes out and everybody loves it a lot and we get something out of it uh, anyway. So, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, I had a good time. I'm having a good time right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the best time in hell I've ever had. Uh, Ludo, do you have any opinions about uh, the way adult animation has changed and the way that the uh, the medium is growing? Yeah, uh, again, like branching off Fable was talking about, I was like, I'm happy to, to see indie productions coming up and cut, like uh, tackling um, subjects like this and moving forward. I'm really excited to see, especially because like what it'll do is push more studios to also do it, but then also get more independent creators the drive to actually put their stories out and build a team just like this one. Um, so I think this is like, it's cool to be around when this is all starting up because I feel like it can only get better from here. Um, and yeah, I, lo I love series like BoJack and stuff where it does go over uh, deep issues, but in a cartoony way that allows you to, uh, I guess, <laughs> come at it with like a different angle um, than you normally would in live action. Yeah, it's almost and... in some ways easier to easier to relate to the characters. And I, I'm not even entirely sure why when they are you get away with ridiculous situations like yeah, in Bojack. It's right. like it allows you to talk about certain subjects because it's ridiculous. It sort of does this thing where it catches you off guard with some very, very goofy humor and then and then just hits you with some emotional note that's just like just cute, like bowls you over. It's like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, time to get uh, real just, sad now. <laughs> yeah, it, it really plays with your emotions, and it can do it so well. Um, it, it's kind of addictive, uh, and I, I think it does it better than any any other like live action show I've seen try to tackle some of the same subject matter. Um, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of nuance that you can get in animation that would be more difficult to get in live action because animation is so sculpted. Like literally every frame is constructed, so you can get a lot of like micro action and micro reactions to things that aren't possible in live action because you I mean the you know live action actors are obviously very very skilled people I'm not saying that they don't do a good job but um the ability to like sculpt like piece by piece your performance and go like how many like little subtle twitches and twings can we get in the character like things that suggest stuff about like how they think and feel that are very subtle that you could pick up on um, if you have like a quick eye or, or on a rewatch. Um, 
and also just the, the artistry of it is compelling. Like even a bad cartoon can be a, a really fun thing to watch because, um, you know, maybe it's just really beautiful to look at. So there, there's many a cartoon where I've just enjoyed watching it just because of the sheer beauty and just the appreciation for the art form. Like there's something in there that's still worthwhile. Um, it, it's it's kind of going back to those, uh, those vintage advertisements. It's like, sure, nowadays we just take the photo of the shoe it's like, look, photo of a shoe. There you go. Buy shoe. Lovely, beautiful shoe. But the painting of the shoe, the the interpretation of the shoe can be way more compelling because you're, you're choosing, like, the lighting, like, what parts of the shoe are you really highlighting, like, the texture of it, the volume of it, um, the way, like, uh, the, the foot sits in the shoe and, like, the pressure of the foot. Like, you can get a sense of the gravity in a way that the photograph doesn't really convey in the same way. And that's like all that abstraction, even when you're going for a very, very realistic look, adds a lot to it. Um, and I just, I, I appreciate and enjoy that illusion. Um, because, I mean, filmmaking in general is about illusion. Like, you know, the, the frame that you see on the screen is not a real thing, it is a picture. There is some abstraction there. But a clear kind of abstraction reveals like what's important about whatever you're depicting. Um, because you t you choose to highlight like what aspect is is what you want to draw attention to. You you make something more detailed in one area than another in order to draw the eye. Yeah. Well, speaking of drawing attention, uh, where can our audiences find more of your work online? Uh, well, the project itself, you can follow its development at littledaisycafe.com. Uh, we effectively have a dev blog. We update it uh, roughly once a week, uh, about three times a month usually, um, with uh, production artwork. Uh, sometimes there's some fan art in there as well, or goofy jokes that we share on the server between crew members. Uh, but we, we really want to share, for the most part, like how we're making this short and uh, give people some insight into how it gets made. Um, you can also follow us on, on YouTube, uh, at Lackadaisy Comic on YouTube. That's our channel, which I please subscribe. <laughs> Once the short's released, it will end up there. And we yeah, are releasing videos there. Yeah, we're releasing um, samples of rough animation and things there um, uh, pretty routinely. We also do lots of uh, like art streams and um, chats with voice actors and things like that that uh, might be fun listening if you're you know, just looking for something to listen to while you yeah. work. So it's, it's um, just the short itself. There's also like a lot to engage with. Right. And, and um, something very consistently. So you could also visit lackadaisy.com. Uh, that's the comics official website. And I link it, like I have links to all the social media and and the devlog from there. So it's kind of a central hub for all of the links. Uh, if, if you're looking to follow us on Twitter or Tumblr or um, mm -hmm. YouTube or Patreon or what have you. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ludo, where can we find you? Um, yeah, I see in the chat you posted um, where you can find my carbon made with some of my boarding examples. Um, but then, if you want to see some of my personal stuff or follow my personal work, um, it's Ludo Doodle. So just the name on here with Doodle uh, next to it, and yeah, you can see a bunch of my stuff there. <laughs> You can follow right, me on Twitter at uh, Fable Paint as well. Like I'll frequently uh, talking about how tired I am. You'll see a lot of drawings <laughs> like that. <laughs> Wind I've down drawings, yeah. <laughs> a lot of a lot of goofy drawings. It's it's uh, Halloween season and the internet loves werewolf Rocky. Been doing a lot of. I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you'd like to see more of our conversations, you can find our discussions archived at youtube.com slash Animation, And be sure to join us next week for a conversation about FX animation. Keep an eye on our social pages for more details. And, and until next time.